This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 8 and 9. Chapter 8 The Pulpit. I had not been seated very long ere a man of a certain venerable robustness entered. Immediately, as the storm-pelted door flew back upon admitting him, a quick, regardful eyeing of him by all of the congregation sufficiently attested that this fine old man was the chaplain. Yes, it was the famous Father Mapple, so called by the whalemen, among whom he was a very great favorite. He had been a sailor and a harpooner in his youth, but for many years past had dedicated his life to the ministry. At the time I now write of, Father Mapple was in the hardy winter of a healthy old age, that sort of old age which seems merging into a second flowering youth, for among all the fissures of his wrinkles there shone certain mild gleams of a newly developing bloom, the spring verdure peeping forth even beneath February's snow. No one, having previously heard his history, could for the first time behold Father Mapple without the utmost interest, because there were certain engrafted clerical peculiarities about him, imputable to that adventurous maritime life he had led. When he entered, I observed that he carried no umbrella, and certainly had not come in his carriage, for his tarpaulin hat ran down with melting sleet, and his great pilot-cloth jacket seemed almost to drag him to the floor with the weight of the water it had absorbed. However, hat and coat and overshoes were one by one removed, and hung up in a little space in an adjacent corner, when, arrayed in a decent suit, he quietly approached the pulpit. Like most old-fashioned pulpits, it was a very lofty one, and, since a regular stairs to such a height would, by its long angle with the floor, seriously contract the already small area of the chapel, the architect, it seemed, had acted upon the hint of Father Mapple, and finished the pulpit without a stairs, substituting a perpendicular side ladder, like those used in mounting a ship from a boat at sea. The wife of a whaling captain had provided the chapel with a handsome pair of red-worsted man-ropes for this ladder, which, being itself nicely headed and stained with a mahogany color, the whole contrivance, considering what manner of chapel it was, seemed by no means in bad taste. Halting for an instant at the foot of the ladder, and with both hands grasping the ornamental knobs of the man-ropes, Father Mapple cast a look upwards, and then with a truly sailor-like but still reverential dexterity, hand over hand, mounted the steps as if ascending the main top of his vessel. The perpendicular parts of this side-ladder, as is usually the case with swinging ones, were of cloth-covered rope. Only the rounds were of wood, so that at every step there was a joint. At my first glimpse of the pulpit it had not escaped me that however convenient for a ship these joints in the present instance seemed unnecessary, for I was not prepared to see Father Mapple, after gaining the height, slowly turn round, and stooping over the pulpit, deliberately drag up the ladder step by step, till the hole was deposited within, leaving him impregnable in his little Quebec. I pondered some time without fully comprehending the reason for this. Father Mapple enjoyed such a wide reputation for sincerity and sanctity that I could not suspect him of courting notoriety by any mere tricks of the stage. No, thought I, there must be some sober reason for this thing. Furthermore, it must symbolize something unseen. Can it be, then, that by that act of physical isolation, he signifies his spiritual withdrawal for the time from all outward worldly ties and connections? Yes, for, replenished with the meat and wine of the word, to the faithful man of God this pulpit, I see, is a self-containing stronghold, a lofty Ehrenbreitstein, with a perennial well of water within the walls. But the side ladder was not the only strange feature of the place, borrowed from the chaplain's former seafarings. Between the marble cenotaphs on either hand of the pulpit, the wall which formed its back was adorned with a large painting representing a gallant ship beating against a terrible storm off a lee coast of black rocks and snowy breakers. 
but high above the flying scud and dark rolling clouds there floated a little isle of sunlight, from which beamed forth an angel's face, and this bright face shed a distinct spot of radiance upon the ship's tossed deck, something like that silver plate now inserted into the victory's plank where Nelson fell. Ah, noble ship, the angel seemed to say, beat on, beat on, thou noble ship, and bear a hearty helm, for lo, the sun is breaking through, the clouds are rolling off, serenest azure is at hand. Nor was the pulpit itself without a trace of the same sea taste that had achieved the latter in the picture. Its panelled front was in the likeness of a ship's bluff bows, and the Holy Bible rested on a projecting piece of scroll-work fashioned after a ship's fiddle-headed beak. What could be more full of meaning? For the pulpit is ever this earth's foremost part. All the rest comes in its rear. The pulpit leads the world. From thence it is the storm of God's quick wrath is first descried, and the bow must bear the earliest brunt. From thence it is, the god of breezes, fair or foul, is first invoked for favorable winds. Yes, the world's a ship on its passage out, and not a voyage complete, and the pulpit is its prow. Chapter 9. The Sermon Father Mapple rose, and in a mild voice of unassuming authority, ordered the scattered people to condense. Starboard gangway there, side away to larboard. "'Larboard gangway to starboard. Midships! Midships!' There was a low rumbling of heavy sea-boots among the benches, and a still slighter shuffling of women's shoes, and all was quiet again, and every eye on the preacher. He paused a little, then kneeling in the pulpit's bows, folded his large brown hands across his chest, uplifted his closed eyes, and offered a prayer so deeply devout that he seemed kneeling and praying at the bottom of the sea. This ended in prolonged solemn tones like the continual tolling of a bell in a ship that is foundering at sea in a fog. In such tones he commenced reading the following hymn, but changing his manner towards the concluding stanzas burst forth with appealing exultation and joy. The ribs and terrors of the whale arched over me in dismal gloom, while all God's sunlit waves rolled by and lift me deepening down to doom. I saw the opening maw of hell with endless pains and sorrows there, which none but they that feel can tell. Oh, I was plunging to despair. In black distress I called my God when I could scarce believe him mine. He bowed his ear to my complaints. No more the wail did me confine. With speed he flew to my relief, as on a radiant dolphin born, Awful yet bright as lightning shone, the face of my deliverer God. My song forever shall record that terrible, that joyful hour. I give the glory to my God, his all the mercy and the power. Nearly all joined in singing this hymn, which swelled high above the howling of the storm. A brief pause ensued. The preacher slowly turned over the leaves of the Bible, and at last, folding his hand down on the proper page, said, Beloved shipmates, clinch the last verse of the first chapter of Jonah. And God had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Shipmates, this book, containing only four chapters, four yarns, is one of the smallest strands in the mighty cable of the scriptures. Yet what depths of the soul does Jonah's deep sea-line sound? What a pregnant lesson to us is this prophet! What a noble thing is that canticle in the fish's belly! How billow-like and boisterously grand! We feel the flood surging over us, we sound with him to the kelpy bottom of the waters. Seaweed and all the slime of the sea is about us. But what is the lesson that this book of Jonah teaches? Shipmates, it is a two-stranded lesson, a lesson to us all as sinful men, and a lesson to me as a pilot of the living God. As sinful men, it is a lesson to us all, because it is the story of the sin, hard-heartedness, suddenly awakened fears, the swift punishment, repentance, prayers, and finally the deliverance and joy of Jonah. As with all sinners among men, the sin of this son of Amittai was in his willful disobedience to the command of God. Never mind now what that command was or how conveyed. 
which he found a hard command. But all things that God would have us do are hard for us to do. Remember that. And hence he oftener commands us than endeavors to persuade. And if we obey God, we must disobey ourselves. And it is in this disobeying ourselves wherein the hardness of obeying God consists. With this sin of disobedience in him, Jonah still further flouts at God by seeking to flee from him. He thinks that a ship made by men will carry him into countries where God does not reign, but only the captains of this earth. He skulks about the wharves of Joppa, and seeks a ship that's bound for Tarshish. There lurks perhaps a hitherto unheeded meaning here. By all accounts Tarshish could have been no other city than the modern Cadiz. That's the opinion of learned men. And where is Cadiz, shipmates? Cadiz is in Spain, as far by water from Joppa as Jonah could possibly have sailed in those ancient days when the Atlantic was an almost unknown sea, because Joppa, the modern Jaffa, shipmates, is on the most easterly coast of the Mediterranean, the Syrian, and Tarshish or Cadiz more than two thousand miles to the westward from that, just outside the Straits of Gibraltar. See ye not then, shipmates, that Jonah sought to flee world-wide from God? Miserable man! Oh, most contemptible, and worthy of all scorn! with slouched hat and guilty eyes, skulking from his god, prowling among the shipping like a vile burglar hastening to cross the seas. So disordered, self-condemning in his look, that had there been policemen in those days, Jonah, on the mere suspicion of something wrong, had been arrested ere he touched a deck. How plainly he's a fugitive! No baggage, not a hat-box, valise, or carpet-bag— no friends accompany him to the wharf with their adieus. At last, after much dodging search, he finds the Tarshi ship receiving the last items of her cargo, and as he steps on board to see its captain in the cabin, all the sailors, for the moment, desist from hoisting in the goods to mark the stranger's evil eye. Jonah sees this, but in vain he tries to look all ease and confidence, in vain essays his wretched smile. Strong intuitions of the men assure the mariners he can be no innocent. In their gamesome but still serious way, one whispers to the other, Jack, he's robbed a widow, or Joe, do you mark him? He's a bigamist, or Harry, lad, I guess he's the adulterer that broke jail in old Gomorrah, or be like one of the missing murderers from Sodom. Another runs to read the bill that's stuck against the spile upon the wharf to which the ship is moored, offering five hundred gold coins for the apprehension of a parricide, and containing a description of his person. He reads and looks from Jonah to the bill, while all his sympathetic shipmates now crowd round Jonah, prepared to lay their hands upon him. Frightened Jonah trembles, and summoning all his boldness to his face only looks so much the more a coward." He will not confess himself suspected, but that itself is strong suspicion. So he makes the best of it, and when the sailors find him not to be the man that is advertised, they let him pass, and he descends into the cabin. "'Who's there?' cries the captain at his busy desk, hurriedly making out his papers for the customs. "'Who's there?' Oh, how that harmless question mangles Jonah! For the instant he almost turns to flee again, but he rallies." I seek a passage in this ship to Tarshish. How soon sail ye, sir? Thus far the busy captain had not looked up to Jonah, though the man now stands before him, but no sooner does he hear that hollow voice than he darts a scrutinizing glance. We sail with the next coming tide, at last he slowly answered, still intently eyeing him. No sooner, sir. Soon enough for any honest man that goes a passenger. Ha! Jonah, that's another stab. But he swiftly calls away the captain from the scent. I'll sail with ye, he says. The passage money, how much is that? I'll pay now. For it is particularly written, shipmates, as if it were a thing not to be overlooked in this history, that he paid the fare thereof ere the craft did sail. And taken with the context, this is full of meaning. Now, Jonah's captain, shipmates, 
was one whose discernment detects crime in any, but whose cupidity exposes it only in the penniless. In this world shipmates, sin that pays its way can travel freely, and without a passport, whereas virtue, if a pauper, is stopped at all frontiers. So Jonah's captain prepares to test the length of Jonah's purse, ere he judge him openly. He charges him thrice the usual sum, and it's assented to. Then the captain knows that Jonah is a fugitive, but at the same time resolves to help a flight that paves its rear with gold. Yet when Jonah fairly takes out his purse, prudent suspicion still molests the captain. He rings every coin to find a counterfeit. Not a forger, anyway, he mutters, and Jonah is put down for his passage. Point out my stateroom, sir, says Jonah now. I'm travel-weary. I need sleep. Thou looks like it, says the captain. There's thy room. Jonah enters, and would lock the door, but the lock contains no key. Hearing him foolishly fumbling there, the captain laughs slowly to himself, and mutters something about the doors of convict cells being never allowed to be locked within. All dressed and dusty as he is, Jonah throws himself into his berth, and finds the little stateroom ceiling almost resting on his forehead. The air is close, and Jonah gasps. Then, in that contracted hole, sunk too beneath the ship's waterline, Jonah feels the heralding presentiment of that stifling hour when the whale shall hold him in the smallest of his bowels' wards. Screwed at its axis against the side, a swinging lamp slightly oscillates in Jonah's room, and the ship heeling over towards the wharf with the weight of the last bales received, the lamp, flame, and all, though in slight motion, still maintains a permanent obliquity with reference to the room, though in truth infallibly straight itself, it but made obvious the false lying levels among which it hung. The lamp alarms and frightens Jonah, as lying in his berth his tormented eyes roll round the place, and this thus far successful fugitive finds no refuge for his restless glance. But that contradiction in the lamp more and more appalls him. The floor, the ceiling, and the side are all awry. Oh, so my conscience hangs in me, he groans, straight upwards so it burns, but the chambers of my soul are all in crookedness. Like one who, after a night of drunken revelry, hies to his bed, still reeling, but with conscience yet pricking him, as the plungings of the Roman racehorse but so much more strike his steel tags into him, as one who in that miserable plight still turns and turns in giddy anguish, praying God for annihilation until the fit be past, and at last amid the whirl of woe he feels a deep stupor steals over him, as over the man who bleeds to death, for conscience is the wound, and there's naught to stanch it. So, after sore wrestlings in his birth, Jonah's prodigy of ponderous misery drags him drowning down to sleep. And now the time of tide has come, the ship casts off her cables, and from the deserted wharf the uncheered ship for Tarshish, all careening, glides to sea. That ship, my friends, was the first of recorded smugglers. The contraband was Jonah. But the sea rebels. He will not bear the wicked burden. A dreadful storm comes on. The ship is like to break. But now, when the boatswain calls all hands to lighten her, when boxes, bales, and jars are clattering overboard, when the wind is shrieking and the men are yelling, and every plank thunders with trampling feet right over Jonah's head, in all this raging tumult, Jonah sleeps his hideous sleep. He sees no black sky and raging sea, feels not the reeling timbers, and little hears he or heeds he the far rush of the mighty whale, which even now with open mouth is cleaving the seas after him. Aye, shipmates, Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, a berth in the cabin as I have taken it, and was fast asleep. But the frightened master comes to him, and shrieks in his dead ear, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise! Startled from his lethargy by that direful cry, Jonah staggers to his feet, and stumbling to the deck, grasps a shroud to look out upon the sea. But at that moment he is sprung upon by a panther billow leaping over the bulwarks. 
Wave after wave thus leaps onto the ship, and finding no speedy vent runs roaring fore and aft, till the mariners come nigh to drowning while yet afloat. And ever, as the white moon shows her affrighted face from the steep gullies in the blackness overhead, aghast Jonah sees the rearing bowsprit pointing high upward, but soon beat downward again towards the tormented deep. Terrors upon terrors run shouting through his soul. In all his cringing attitudes the god-fugitive is now too plainly known. The sailors mark him. More and more certain grow their suspicions of him, and at last fully to test the truth, by referring the whole matter to high heaven they fall to casting lots, to see for whose cause this great tempest was upon him. The lot is Jonah's. That discovered, then how furiously they mob him with their questions. What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? Thy country? What people? But mark now, shipmates, the behavior of poor Jonah. The eager mariners but ask him who he is and where from, whereas they not only receive an answer to those questions, but likewise another answer to a question not put by them. But the unsolicited answer is forced from Jonah by the hard hand of God that is upon him. I am a Hebrew, he cries, and then, I fear the Lord God of heaven who hath made the sea and the dry land. Fear him, O Jonah. Aye, well mightst thou fear the Lord God, then... Straight away he now goes on to make a full confession, whereupon the mariners became more and more appalled, but still are pitiful. For when Jonah, not yet supplicating God for mercy, since he but too well knew the darkness of his deserts, when wretched Jonah cries out to them to take him and cast him forth into the sea, for he knew that it was for his sake this great tempest was upon them, they mercifully turn from him and seek by other means to save the ship, but all in vain. The indignant gale howls louder, and then, with one hand raised invokingly to God, with the other they not unreluctantly lay hold of Jonah. And now behold Jonah taken up as an anchor and dropped into the sea, when instantly an oily calmness floats out from the east, and the sea is still as Jonah carries down the gale with him, leaving smooth water behind. He goes down in a whirling heart of such a masterless commotion that he scarce heeds the moment when he drops seething into the yawning jaws awaiting him, and the whale shoots too all his ivory teeth like so many white bolts upon his prison. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord out of the fish's belly. But observe his prayer and learn a weighty lesson. For sinful as he is, Jonah does not weep and wail for direct deliverance. He feels that his dreadful punishment is just. He leaves all his deliverance to God, contenting himself with this, that spite of all his pains and pangs he will still look towards his holy temple. And here, shipmates, is true and faithful repentance, not clamorous for pardon, but grateful for punishment. And how pleasing to God was this conduct in Jonah is shown in the eventual deliverance of him from the sea and the whale. Shipmates, I do not place Jonah before you to be copied for his sin, but I do place him before you as a model for repentance. Sin not, but if you do, take heed to repent of it like Jonah. While he was speaking these words, the howling of the shrieking, slanting storm without seemed to add new power to the preacher, who, when describing Jonah's sea storm, seemed tossed by a storm himself, his deep chest heaved as with a groundswell, his tossed arms seemed the warring elements at work, and the thunders that rolled away from off his swarthy brow, and the light leaping from his eye, made all his simple hearers look on him with a quick fear that was strange to them. There now came a lull in his look as he silently turned over the leaves of the book once more, and at last, standing motionless, with closed eyes, for the moment seemed communing with God and himself. But again he leaned towards the people, and bowing his head lowly with an aspect of the deepest yet manliest humility, he spake these words. Shipmates, God has laid but one hand upon you. Both his hands press upon me. I have read ye by what murky light may be mine the lesson that Jonah teaches to all sinners, and therefore to you, and still more to me, for I am a greater sinner than you. 
and now how gladly would I come down from this masthead and sit on the hatches there where you sit, and listen as you listen, while some one of you reads me that other and more awful lesson which Jonah teaches to me as a pilot of the living God. How, being anointed pilot prophet, or speaker of true things, and bidden by the Lord to sound those unwelcome truths in the ears of a wicked Nineveh, Jonah, appalled at the hostility he should raise, fled from his mission, and sought to escape his duty and his God by taking ship at Joppa. But God is everywhere. Tarshish he never reached. As we have seen, God came upon him in the whale, and swallowed him down to the living gulfs of doom, and with swift slantings tore him along into the midst of the seas, where the eddying depths sucked him ten thousand fathoms down, and the weeds were wrapped about his head, and all the watery world of woe bowled over him. Yet even then, beyond the reach of any plummet, out of the belly of hell, when the whale grounded upon the ocean's utmost bones, even then God heard the engulfed repenting prophet when he cried. Then God spake unto the fish, and from the shuddering cold and blackness of the sea the whale came breaching up towards the warm and pleasant sun, and all the delights of air and earth, and vomited out Jonah upon the dry land, when the word of the Lord came a second time. And Jonah, bruised and beaten, his ears like two seashells, still multitudinously murmuring of the ocean, Jonah did the Almighty's bidding. And what was that, shipmates? To preach the truth to the face of falsehood. That was it. This, shipmates, is the other lesson, and woe to that pilot of the living God who slights it. Woe to him whom this world charms from gospel duty. Woe to him who seeks to pour oil upon the waters when God has brewed them into a gale. Woe to him who seeks to please rather than to appall. Woe to him whose good name is more to him than goodness. Woe to him who in this world courts not dishonor. Woe to him who would not be true, even though to be false were salvation. Yea, woe to him who, as the great pilot Paul has it, while preaching to others is himself a castaway. He dropped and fell away from himself for a moment, then, lifting his face to them again, showed a deep joy in his eyes as he cried out with a heavenly enthusiasm, But, oh, shipmates, on the starboard hand of every woe there is a sure delight, and higher the top of that delight than the bottom of the woe is deep. Is not the main truck higher than the kelson is low? Delight is to him a far, far upward and inward delight, who against the proud gods and commodores of this earth ever stands forth his own inexorable self. Delight is to him whose strong arms yet support him when the ship of this base, treacherous world has gone down beneath him. Delight it is to him who gives no quarter in the truth, and kills, burns, and destroys all sin, though he pluck it out from under the robes of senators and judges. Delight, top-gallant delight, is to him who acknowledges no law or lord but the Lord his God, and is only a patriot to heaven. Delight is to him whom all the waves of the billows of the seas and the boisterous mob can never shake from this sure keel of the ages. An eternal delight and deliciousness will be his, who, coming to lay him down, can say with his final breath, O oh, Father, chiefly known to me by thy rod, mortal or immortal, here I die. I have striven to be thine more than to be this world's or mine own. Yet this is nothing. I leave eternity to thee, for what is man that he should live out the lifetime of his God? He said no more, but slowly waving a benediction, covered his face with his hands, and so remained kneeling till all the people had departed, and he was left alone in the place. End of chapters 8 and 9